Um, so, um, as you uh, might have noticed in response to the ongoing uh, COVID-19 pandemic, governments across the world have imposed uh, measures to reduce transmission of the virus. These measures generally involve some form of a shelter in place uh, in which the majority of the population remains in their homes except for essential activities like grocery shop shopping. The motivation, of course, is to reduce the spread or the R0 enough to decrease the demand on the healthcare services um, at any given moment and gain time to develop testing capacity drugs in a vaccine. Now, the stay in place orders have been guided by extensive modeling of the COVID 19 pandemic to predict its future and understand its impact on the population under various scenarios. Um, by necessity, stay in place orders involve exceptions for essential workers, typically including those involved in the delivery of healthcare, the production and distribution of food emergency services and defense, public works and utilities, communications and information technology, and logistics and delivery. In New York City, essential workers were estimated to comprise a 20%, 25% of the workforce, or over a 1 million people, of whom over half are employed in healthcare, and about 15% in grocery convenience and drug stores. While in California, one in eight people is thought to be an essential worker. Yet to our knowledge, existing models do not explicitly consider how the presence of essential workers, who in many cases cannot match the reductions in transmission of others, impacts the efficacy of stay in place measures, um, or how the risk of the infection differs among types of essential workers and those under a stay in place orders. So, um, our starting point for, for modeling this is the standard uh, is a standard SEIR model akin to that recently used by Lipschitz and colleagues and many others. Um, individuals uh, start from uh, the susceptible class and then uh, upon infection they move to an exposed class and then into one of three kinds of infected classes without symptoms, with symptoms, but without requiring hospitalizations, and those requiring a hospitalization. And then within the hospital, we also have um, several states, including those that uh, require hospitalization, but uh, no critical care and go directly to recovery, those that require critical care and go to recovery, and those that require critical care and uh, die. So, to parameterize this model, um, by which I mean uh, primarily the parameters for the duration uh, that individuals stay in various states and the probabilities of moving between these states, we use uh, estimates from the uh, current uh, COVID-19 uh, literature. And just to show you as an example, here's data from Washington where you see that despite this, these kind of models involving a, a lot of simplifications, they can actually a, fit the data quite well by adjusting a couple of parameters, specifically the basic reproductive number R0 and the, re the proportional reduction in this reproductive number after a lockdown, which is a, this a blue line a, over here. Um, so this model fits data from many other places. A, it, other than in the initial conditions here that just have to do with how we set up the initial conditions in, in the model. So to a model a essential, a, the role of essential workers, we then clone this model a, into two separate populations representing non-essentials that you see on the top here and essential workers and investigate how different models for within and between population disease transmission represented by these betas that you see over here, uh, impact predictions of pandemic uh, progression and disease risk of individuals in each population. So for example, we consider a uh, public facing workers, you could think about the cashiers in grocery stores, which continue to interact among themselves and with others at the same rate as they did before lockdown. Uh, where in this model, only the transmission rate among non-essentials, showed in red here, is uh, reduced. Uh, um, another type of archetype could be uh, the um, 
the non-public facing workers. So you can think about say, factory workers, for example, which continue to interact among themselves, but not uh, with others at the same rate as they did before the lockdown. So in this case, uh, the transmission rate among essential workers is a, only mi a minorly reduced, but all the other a, a, um, transmission rates are reduced after lockdown. And then there's a third type of essential worker remodel, which are a, hospital workers, where in this case, um, it, the infections are due to people in the hospital infecting the uh, healthcare workers. So just to clarify, these models are not intended for making quantitative predictions about the uh, pandemic in any particular region or to capture the full complexity of interactions among and between essential and unessential workers, but rather to understand in general terms how the presence of essential workers might impact the efficacy of social distancing measures. So here you see an example. Uh, comparing a case uh, in the bottom row here in which 5% of the population are public facing workers, uh, like uh, cashiers, uh, and, and on the top row you see a, a model without essential workers. So in both models, just to match them, we take the same um, uh, r not before the lockdown and we uh, um, assume that the so this is seeing reduced R naught uh, to to half uh, among the uh, non-essentials after the lockdown, and uh, in these graphs, what you see is the fraction of the population in each state, either susceptible, infected, hospitalized, or recovered and dead. Um, now, if you focus on the proportion of infected in the second column over here you see that uh, having public uh, facing, facing workers delays the suppression of the epidemic, as you see uh, in this green line going down more slowly in, in the model with public facing workers. Intuitively, this is because such workers serve as a conduit for the transmission of the disease among non-essential workers. And as you could also see, looking for example, the, at the proportion of susceptible, how, how much it goes down, you could see that having these public facing workers um, actually uh, causes uh, many more infections over the long run. Um, here's another uh, um, uh, type of result from this kind of model. So here you see a heat map uh, on the right uh, where uh, the, the, the heats uh, represent the cumulative proportion of infections over a period of a year where the yellow corresponds to practically all the population being infected, and the blue uh, uh, stands for uh, um, uh, essentially managing to uh, uh, repress the, the epidemic. And on the y-axis, what you hear, what you have is uh, the uh, fraction of essential workers, where when that's zero, that corresponds to the case without essential workers. And on the x-axis over here, what you have is the proportional reduction in, in the in R0 uh, due to uh, social distancing, where the red line that you see over here corresponds to where 10% uh, of the population gets infected. And what you see is that when the proportion of essential workers increases, then a stricter distancing uh, among non-essential workers is needed to obtain the same level of suppression, which is uh, rather intuitive. Um, so, this was for one type of essential workers. So here you see the cumulative number of infections for different kinds of essential workers, as well as for the uh, population average. And as you could see here on the left, uh, the chances for infection are substantially higher among essential workers, as you might expect. Uh, this is most extreme for the healthcare uh, workers and least extreme for the public facing uh, workers, which you see in the dashed uh, blue line over here. Um, in contrast, when you look Guy, at... Guy, one minute check. Thank you. Um, so in contrast, when you look at the right here, the population average, actually in the presence of public-facing workers, they have the greatest effect on the population average. Again, because they act as a conduit between uh, other non-essentials, whereas uh, um, the healthcare workers have a, a less of an impact than the factory workers. So 
Um, the few examples that I showed you illustrate some more general take home messages. One is that essential workers can affect the pandemic uh, quite substantially. Another is that they themselves have a, are at higher risk and they also affect average risk in the population. And lastly, the different kinds of essential workers differ in both the risk to them and to the population. So these considerations carry several potential implications about, for example, the cost of increasing the numbers of uh, workers of different kinds and prioritizing the deployment of measures such as protective measures and testing. Um, so in closing, I'd just like to uh, acknowledge all my collaborators on this work and specifically uh, Will, who you see on the left here, and uh, Zach on the right, who did uh, much of the heavy lifting uh, on this uh, project. Thank you. Thank you, Guy. Um, if there are any questions, please uh, raise your hands. Margaret. Hello, thank you so much for your, um, for your talk. Uh, two questions. Um, uh, the one question is, I think, you know, the answer to this is probably ob obvious, but I wanna hear from you, um, that, um, this the fact that you have so many people of color working in these essential worker um, jobs that that may explain the um, um, it may explain the disparate impact of the disease in some of those uh, uh, some of, among some of those groups. That's question number one. Number two, um, if it's the case that these essential workers, as you obviously pointed out, are conduits, well, obviously that's a very dangerous thing. And I'm just sort of thinking about things like Walmart hiring. Um, and bringing on new workers, that that then serves, could serve as a conduit, conduit for the further spread of the disease and what your thoughts are about that. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know specifically about people of color, but there's definitely a, a, you know, a bunch of factors. So for example, in boroughs of New York, I think it's a, in, 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 in one of the boroughs, something like half of, of the healthcare workers in New York come from one of the boroughs and that's the borough that's been hit the hardest as far as I know. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, in terms of the severity of the disease, then obviously there's the issue of, uh, of comorbidities that are uh, related to socioeconomic state. So, so that's another type of factor. Um, with regards to, um, so can you remind me to say what was the second question was? Well, the, the, the question is, is that it is that a lot of the places, so for example, in the food supply chain, so uh, places like Walmart are actually hiring, they're hiring more people because there have been, of course, a rush on the Walmart for food and this kind of thing. Um, and so it, doesn't that place us further at risk again, because that actually increases the number of public facing essential workers, I guess is what I'm, what I'm saying. And with an increase in the number of public facing essential workers, if they are in fact conduits and then conduits to non um, essential uh, 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 workers, that then increases the risk of the disease, does it, of, the, of the virus spread. Yes, so, so um, I, I, I think it does. And, you know, in terms of thinking of how one could mitigate it, so, you know, obviously you could limit the number of public facing workers. Uh, uh, but beyond that, um, you know, I think we've seen in, in New York the progression, if you just go uh, grocery shopping, on how in the beginning there was, a, you know, a lack of protection, and now it's mm -hmm. you know, much more protection. And I think, uh, you know, that could be implemented in other parts of the country where they're, you know, earlier on a, in, in the process. And, you know, of course, you know, if at some point testing becomes a, a available at much larger numbers, but not enough for the whole population, then you could think about prioritizing some populations of essential workers, for example. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Hello, Guy. Mike Shadlin. Uh, thanks very much for the talk. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, so uh, it, it's a fascinating model. Um, have you considered introducing, um, as the specificity and sensitivity of the antibody tests come through, and it's going to affect what we do with people facing the public, and just running through the various um, predictive value, positive and negative, uh, uh, to see how it would affect the different classes of, uh, of uh, essential workers. 
Right, so one, one of the things we started looking at and might uh, continue is, uh, is uh, the effect of various interventions. So for example, if you have um, a certain number of tests you could do per day and you allocate them, say, to a certain type of essential worker versus, uh, you know, just uniformly in the population and you remove, obviously, those that test positive or you just, uh, um, you know, uh, take fever of people in the subway or... or um, uh, etc. Then uh, how these uh, different interventions uh, might affect the uh, you know the overall spread of the of the epidemic. So we 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 haven't we don't have you know obvious results for that yet, but we're we're looking into it. Uh, we have a question from Shanine Darmiento. Yes, Guy, you sort of brought this up. Um, I can't help but think about how much the fact that the CDC didn't recommend masks and that the essential workers um, obviously didn't have masks, that the healthcare workers didn't have sufficient PPE led to this spike that you're looking at. And how can you, is there a way that you can um, model, you know, what, what it is now, now that they're better, that they have better protection? Um, I, I think all these uh, spikes that we saw in New York City are a result of some of those issues. Do you, do you think so? Um, so, you know, I, I, I de exercise caution in, uh, you know, interpreting the quantitative results of this kind of modeling uh, too specifically. Um, you, I'd say it's more about getting a qualitative or sense of, of the effects of various measures. You could, uh, you know, you, you could play around, but of course you need to make assumptions about parameters and we don't have very, uh, about parameter values and we don't have uh, very good measures. Of, um, very good ways of estimating those. Um, so, um, you know, I, I don't know if I have anything to say from the modeling uh, at the moment uh, that is not a common sense in terms of the effects of, you know, particular stages and these kinds of uh, policies. 